College basketball fans around the country now know that Juju Watkins is a legitimate star. In a nationally televised game on ESPN last night, the Compton freshman dropped 32 points against Arizona. USC wins by 17. Four straight for the Trojans. Watkins has had 30 or more points in nine games. She's one game shy of the single season record set by USC legend Cheryl Miller in 1984-85. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. Climbing is king. At KBLA Talk 1580, we believe that caring for the community means caring about the climate. You might have heard that we announced a pretty bold 12-month, $2 million campaign to do four things. Increase climate literacy, turn up the volume on communities of color in the climate conversation, connect everyday people with the resources they need to survive and thrive, and highlight frontline climate justice crusaders of color throughout this year. KBLA Talk 1580 will be bringing you insightful interviews on all of our shows to help raise your climate IQ. Each quarter this year, we will also be hosting free climate events in various communities throughout the city with food, fun, and forward-thinking conversations. Thanks to partners like LADWP, Metro, Caltrans, the Sierra Club, the California Community Foundation, the California Endowment, AQMD, MWD, and more. You'll also be hearing more about a couple of national town halls broadcasting live from Los Angeles, to which you will be invited. And we'll be rolling out a robust social media campaign on all our platforms, as well as an outdoor media campaign, all designed to educate, enlighten, and empower you in our fight for climate justice. We want cleaner air. Caring about the community means caring about the climate. At KBLA Talk 1580, we believe that we really can change the world. If we care enough, 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 we care enough. KBLA Talk 1580. <laughs> and it's time for our daily deep dive. Today I'm so pleased to welcome an author, publisher, cultural historian, artist, and an educational consultant. He's a graduate of Howard University's College of Fine Arts. He's lectured all over the U.S., Africa, the Caribbean, Mexico, Japan, and Europe on issues related to African and African American history and culture. He's the founder and director of of IKG Cultural Resources, and he's, do, um, he's devoted 30 years to researching ancient Egyptian history, science, philosophy, and culture. Dr. Anthony T. Browder, welcome. Good morning, Sister Dominique. How are you? I'm blessed. How are you? I'm great. I'm great, and I'm pleased to be on your show today and pleased to be ushered in by my favorite group, Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> that was Miles. He felt you on that. Um, yeah, they and they clearly, you know, back in the day, had their fixation on this sort of ancient Egyptian aesthetic in some way, right? Absolutely, and I, I do have to credit Maurice White with 
uh, spurring my interest in ancient Egypt. Really? Uh, from 1977 on, every Earth, Wind, and Fire cover, from the Spirit album on, every Earth, Wind, and Fire cover uh, features some element of ancient Egyptian history and culture. And now, I'm from Chicago, which is where Maurice White um, made his entree into the music industry. And Maurice grew up within a community of African-centered musicians and scholars. So he understood the importance of Kemet, of ancient Egyptian history and culture. And Maurice then found a way to incorporate these elements within his music so that while he was entertaining us, he was also educating us and enlightening us. And I was fortunate to be enveloped in his uh, historical and, and musical traditions, and it's kept me on this path ever since. Wow, I did not know that. Good call, Miles, with the Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, I love Earth, Wind, and Fire, too. But I also find that, you know, pretty much anyone from Tupac, and, and I never knew this about Earth, Wind, and Fire, but many, whether they're artists or whether they're activists, if you look in the family tree or in the immediate environment, you're going to find scholars and you're going to find activists. And those cultural institutions, uh, whether they be school, community schools or community centers that offer this education, and then it passes on from generation to generation. Rarely does it just come from out of nowhere, right, Dr. Browder? Right. Well, Dominique, what you're describing is the tradition of knowledge keepers. There has always been groups of men and women who were keepers of the flame, keepers of the knowledge. And despite enslavement, despite wars, despite segregation and discrimination, their job was to retain this information and pass it on to those souls who were willing to receive it so that they then can internalize this information, um, receive the, the culture of the time, so to speak, carry it as far as they can, and then pass it off to the next generation so that we can continue keeping this thirst for knowledge and information alive. And, and if, I must say, Dominique, that we don't do this just to say that we know our history and culture. We do it because it is our life. It is a thing that has sustained us as a people. And because of the fact that we are getting closer to the mark is the reason why governors in, in Texas and Florida and Virginia and elsewhere are attempting to erase African history and culture, erase uh, or minimize discussions about enslavement and discrimination. We are winning this war. And it's only due to the consistent effort of countless souls who have made sure that we have not forgotten our struggles and our victories. When you say we're winning this war, you're talking about the war of knowledge. We're, we're talking about the war of knowledge, but more specifically, my sister, we're talking about the war for the souls of our people, the war for the souls on this planet. I was listening to your last segment, and you were talking about the importance of uh, of the environment of us understanding that we live on this on this rock the third rock from the sun and that this is our only home and if we destroy the air and the water and and the resources on this planet then we destroy ourselves so we should know that there are people who don't care about the planet who don't mm -hmm. care about the people on this planet who don't care about what we know or how we go or how we live our lives and so we're fighting for our lives we're fighting for our souls we're fighting for every on this planet. And it's a war that has to be won by conscientious people who are dedicated to something bigger than their own personal selves. You know, I, I've, over the years, I've talked to uh, different scholars, and um, one of them, of course, you're paying tribute to. We'll talk about that. Uh, Renoko Rashidi was on my show many, 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 many times. Sure. And one of the questions that I ask, and I'll ask you uh, specifically, because this is a particular area of focus for you, is about the importance of Egypt. You know, Africa is a huge continent. It's got 54, 55 nations, depending on who you ask. Um, and yet many of our top scholars focus on Egypt or Kemet, as you referred to it earlier. Why is that? Kemet is important. Kemet matters because it represents the greatest documented civilization of all times. Kemet, and we have to put Kemet into context. You're right. Uh, 
Kemet is in Egypt. Egypt is just one country on the continent of Africa, but Kemet is a byproduct of Nile Valley civilization. So Nile Valley civilization follows the entire 4,100 mile path of the Nile River flowing out of Uganda, right now flows out of Uganda, the Blue Nile folk flows out of Ethiopia, the two Niles meet in Khartoum, and they form the continuous now Valley, uh, now River, which as John Henry Clark said, was the world's cultural highway. And so we have people, we have knowledge uh, flowing from inner Africa through Ethiopia and Sudan, Kush, into Kemet. So Kemet is the byproduct of all of the greatness in Africa. And so we have the beginning of architecture, uh, the beginning of government, the beginning of agriculture, food development, psychology, medicine, architecture, engineering. We have the greatest documentation of the genius of Africa in one specific location. And so there has been a concerted effort, specifically throughout the late 19th and early um, and 20th century to take Egypt out of Africa, to put Egypt somewhere in the Middle East, if there is such a place, and to separate African people from their own history and culture. Whoever controls the legacy of Kemet, the legacy of the Nile Valley, controls the legacy of knowledge production in the world. That's why Kemet matters. Okay, so I'm, I'm going kind of basic here because we haven't been having th these conversations on this particular radio station on this particular show, even though I have history of doing it for many, many years. So talk talk about the term Kemet and why you refer to Egypt as Kemet rather than Egypt or as you referenced the Middle East. Sure. Well, let me give you some context. I've been studying this history for 47 years. I have... Uh, traveled to Egypt 67 times since 1980. For the past 14 years, I have financed uh, archaeological excavations on the West Bank of Luxor, Egypt. So I've devoted a considerable portion of my life to studying this history and to propagating this information to, to the world in general. Uh, when we talk about Kemet, uh, we're talking about African people who were literally responsible for controlling the greatest nation on the face of the planet. People marvel today about how the pyramids were built, how the temples and, uh, were constructed, and the whole purpose is behind that. But 90% of what we've been taught about, about Egypt is wrong. Egypt is a Greek word. Sphinx is a Greek word. Um, uh, pyramid is a Greek word. So if we cannot identify these African things by their original names, we have no idea what we're talking about. So the work that uh, scholars like Renoko and uh, Ivan Van Sertema and John Henry Clark and Asa Hilliard and, and Dr. Ben and others have committed themselves to is to make this information available to people of African ancestry specifically because we are the ones whose memories have been erased and the erasure has been forgotten. So Kemet matters because it represents the greatness of African people. And there's also some new research that I was able to uncover in 2016, where I found evidence in two, uh, two tombs in Egypt, on the West Bank of Egypt. I found evidence of an Adinkra symbol. The heart-shaped Akoma or Sankofa symbol is painted on the two on the ceiling of two 2,700-year-old tombs. So what that has done is open up opportunities to discuss what our colleagues of Sheikh Abdeljab wrote about, and that is the migrations of African people and African culture from the Nile to the Niger. So we can now document the transference of history and culture, science and philosophy, architecture, engineering, and astronomy in six different migrations between 650 BC and 555 AD. And now we can show direct correlations between Africans on the West Coast, Ghana, Senegal, and Nigeria, uh, Mali. We can show direct cultural connections between these people. And this, we now then project this, this concept, this idea, this reality of the Maasa, the enslavement of African people, then we can now draw direct parallels between Africans living in America and Africans who were stolen from the West Coast of Africa, whose ancestors migrated there from the East Coast of Africa. So it's opening up a whole new area of study and research that will transform the consciousness 
of, of African people young and old when they're introduced to this information. Mm. Talking with Dr. Anthony T. Browder, also um, the first African-American, Nick, first African-American to fund and coordinate uh, the kind of archaeological dig that he's describing in Egypt. And he's led more than 30, it's probably more than that since this bio was written, archaeological uh, missions to Egypt since 2009. You talk about uh, go directly uh, to the source. Um, and we'll continue the conversation. You're invited in, 800 920 You're listening to KBLA Talk 1580. KBLA Talk 1580 is an intervention. When we come forward, forward. includes you. KBLA Talk 1580, turning pain into power. At KBLA Talk 1580, we do black history every single day. In fact, as the only black talk radio station west of the Mississippi, we are black history. Our annual Black History Month luncheon is fast approaching, and we want to be sure to give you ample time to get your company, organization, church, or group to join us at this year's celebration on the last day of the month, Thursday, February 29th at noon. Last year, we honored iconic local black media personalities, including Pat Harvey, Jim Hill, Mark Brown, Beverly White, Sandy Banks, and Pat Prescott, and raised $20,000 in scholarships. This year, we're honoring Black Hollywood creatives who have used their artistic genius as climate justice champions. At this year's luncheon, we will be showcasing and sharing their inspiring work on our big screen. Plus, a scrumptious meal, live music, great company, and lots of fun with your favorite KBLA Talk 1580 hosts. So contact us today at info at smileyaudiomedia.com or call 323 323- 290-4690. That's info at smileyaudiomedia.com or call 323-290-4690. We hope to see you Thursday, February 29th as we close out Black History Month. At KBLA Talk 1580, we've got your black. Your black. It's time to represent your community in the 2024 presidential primary election. When you vote, you get to decide what is best for you, your neighborhood, and your family. Use your power. Make a plan to vote today. Visit plan.lavote.gov. That's plan.lavote.gov to get everything you need to vote in the March 5th presidential primary election. Brought to you by the Los Angeles County Registrar. Can I get a weight reading on the cat in exam three? Zuri needs a new vet tech after their current one literally moved to a farm. But finding an ideal replacement takes some training. This is like hurting cats. Indeed can help them hire great people fast. I need Indeed. Indeed you do. Schedule virtual interviews and talk to candidates right from your employer dashboard. Visit indeed.com slash credit and get $75 towards your first sponsored job. Terms and conditions apply. Thanks for waking up with Dominique DePrima on KBLA Talk 1580. And we're talking with author, publisher, cultural historian, artist, and educational consultant, Anthony T. Browder. 67 trips to Egypt um, in his lifetime and in, in, in studying. Um, and you were talking about the importance of Kemet, the perceptions. Uh, it reminded me of the brouhaha over Jada Pinkett Smith's um, Cleopatra, right? Which I watched. I really liked it. Um, and I've, I've talked to scholars, including Renoko and others, um, that I've had the opportunity to talk to over the years about Cleopatra and how we really don't know what her background is. Maybe she was black, maybe she wasn't, but, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith chose black actresses, uh, to portray her rather well. And Egypt is now making their own version of Cleopatra. They're producing a movie. They were so angry. They tried to get Netflix to pull it. Uh, Now they're doing their own version of it. And it just amazes me because Hollywood has done probably a dozen Cleopatra movies. None of the actors portraying Cleopatra have been black and Egypt didn't care. So talk to me about, you know, how this dovetails with what you were saying in terms of the narrative and taking sure. the black out of Egypt. <laughs> sure. Well, uh, to your point, Dominique, there have been over 19 Hollywood productions on the, the life of Cleopatra and probably the most um, 
uh, well-viewed picture was the Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton um, story that came out in the 1960s. That film at the time was the highest uh, produced film in Hollywood history. So what's, what's the importance of Cleopatra? We have to have some historical context. Cleopatra, there were eight Cleopatras. The one that people talk about is Cleopatra number seven. And, and she represents the end of Greek rule in Egypt. Egypt consisted of 30 dynasties. Egypt was conquered by the Greeks in 332 B.C. Alexander Macedonia came in with his troops and took control of Egypt and established the Greek dynasty of Egypt. Cleopatra represents the end of 300 years of, Egypt, uh, of Greek rulership in Egypt. So as part of the traditions in the Nile Valley and in Kemet specifically, the ascendancy to, to the throne is determined by the bloodline of the mother. That's important. So that when the Greeks came into Egypt, Alexander saw himself as a continuation of the Kemetic legacy. He, he threw away the title of Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia, and he then declared himself to be Alexander, the son of Amman, or, or Amen, a primary uh, spiritual personality in the Nile Valley. So Alexander of Macedonia, the Greek, rejected his Greek culture and embraced African culture. After he died, his generals divided up his territory. One of the generals, Ptolemy, got control of Egypt. And so they followed the traditions of the uh, Kemetic rulers before. They married African women so that their children could be seen as the legitimate heirs to the throne. Cleopatra is a byproduct of this relationship. So we would say, using American terminology, that she was biracial, that she was colored. And based upon the writings of Thomas Jefferson in his book, Notes for the States of Virginia, if you have one drop of black blood, you are black. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Cleopatra was not white by any stretch of the imagination. But because of the fact people have stretched their imaginations in this effort to remove Egypt from Africa and African people from their own culture, they made Cleopatra white. So what we're witnessing in Egypt last year with the rejection of the Netflix Cleopatra film is the current government in Egypt has taken an anti-Afrocentric approach. We should remember that this time last year they canceled Kevin Hart's presentation in Cairo because of an interview where he supposedly said that our ancestors were kings and queens in Egypt. I found no evidence of that interview, but they spread this propaganda in order to cancel his program. They attempted to cancel Cleopatra and have made their own film, their own version of Cleopatra. They canceled uh, Travis Smiley. Uh, they have been aggressing, moving against so-called African centered scholars who are trying to appropriate their history. So what we're seeing in Egypt right now is an extension of the efforts here in the United States of America by many Republican forces to eradicate African history, African American history. So they're, they're two wings on the same bird. And, and as I mentioned earlier, what their desperate actions represent is that we are winning this war. We're using the history, we're using technology, we're using sources, resources available to us to advance the true interpretation of an African history and culture. And the only thing that they can do is shout loudly and continue to perpetuate the lies that those lies are coming to an end. Well, part That's of, what's happening now in real time. I mean, but part of it is also like, this to me, it feels like an attempt to confuse people because people look at Egyptians now and they're Arab, and so people think though that means that Egyptian culture is Arab culture, right? Exactly, exactly. So we need to understand chronology. Uh, the the first dynasty of Kemet was founded approximately 3200 BCE. Dynastic Kemet ended in 332 BC. Greeks came in, ruled. Uh, Egypt, changed the name of Kemet to Egypt, ruled the nation for approximately 300 years until the death of Cleopatra, and the Romans took control of Egypt in uh, 30 BC and controlled Egypt for approximately 300 years before they fell. Arabs did not come into Egypt until 648 AD. 
the Arabs who now control Egypt, control all of the temples and the monuments in Egypt, now falsely claim out of ignorance, because most Egyptians don't even know the history of Kemet. Um, they believe that their ancestors, as a matter of fact, this is a line that they've been touting in the Egyptian government over the past year, that they are the direct descendants of King Tut. That is utter nonsense to anyone who knows the history, but anyone who studies history knows that history is, as Voltaire said, the lie agreed upon. People use history in order to change the minds of the public and move them in a direction that is favorable to their intentions. So history has always been a weapon. And for those of us who've been involved in correcting the historical misinformation of people on the African continent and Africans in America in the diaspora, we, we understand very clearly what's at stake. We are fighting for the minds of our people. We're fighting for the thoughts of our people. Ultimately, we're fighting for the souls of our people. And because of the fact that we've been in this fight, we've been in this struggle for well over 600 years, many of our people are not prepared, Dominique, mentally or emotionally to even participate in the struggle because they bought into the lies. And oftentimes, people who have been fed a consistent diet of lies will be the first to reject the truth when they hear it because yeah. their system is called cognitive dissonance. And the system is not compatible to the truth. So we understand the psychology of miseducation, mm -hmm. as Dr. Carter G. Whitson wrote about. And it's a real thing. But despite the opposition to these truths, we press on because the truth is all that matters. Um, you, you, you referenced Travis Scott. I think you said Smiley by accident, but you were talking about the Travis oh, Scott Live Nation uh, yes. tour that was supposed to go to Egypt last year. And apparently the Egyptian government said that the show goes against the cultural identity of the Egyptian mm -hmm. people, which is a pretty remarkable reason to, to cancel a concert. <laughs> But listen, but they also said that they rejected him for his Afrocentric views. Travis so again, Scott. They went after Travis, exactly. The notable, the notable activists, <laughs> Kevin Hart and Travis Scott. Are you kidding me? Wow. Don't let KRS-One or Kendrick Lamar try to go there. That, that, that's going to be all bad. But I think it, it is really interesting. Um, they, they, said, they said that he stood in, in opposition to their authentic societal values and traditions. And what's happening now in, in what you're saying, the lie agreed upon, is this, this rewriting, this claiming of black history by, um, you know, an Arab government, which are basically, you know, a set, uh, a, one wave of colonizers uh, that come you know, from what you point out, 648 A.D., long after the building of those pyramids or whatever the real name is for them, and long after the uh, groundbreaking uh, founding of civilization, medicine, ma modern mathematics, and so much more that comes out of Kemet. We're talking with Dr. Anthony T. T. Browder. Happy Black History Month from all of us at KBLA Talk 1580. She's reclaiming her time on KBLA Talk 1580. More First Things First with Dominic DePrima when we come forward. I'm Mike Moore. Here's the latest from the Black Information Network. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is expected to make a full recovery after he was hospitalized Sunday for an emergent bladder issue. Major General Pat Ryder told reporters Austin transferred his powers to Deputy Secretary of Defense Kathleen Hicks. The African-American Defense Secretary will not travel to Brussels for a meeting on Ukraine aid this week. A judge has dismissed the lawsuits against Harvard University over the alleged sale of body parts from the school morgue. Relatives of people whose bodies were donated to Harvard had sued the college for negligence after the morgue manager was accused of stealing and selling their body parts. A Superior Court judge had ruled that Harvard did not act in bad faith as alleged by the plaintiffs. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. 
Did you know Discover wants everyone to feel special? That's why with your Discover card, you have access to 24-7 customer service, as well as $0 fraud liability, which means you're never held responsible for unauthorized purchases. Learn more at discover.com slash credit card. Limitations apply. Is this the title? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. I'm a bad man. The Clippers could have moved into the top spot in the Western Conference with a win over Minnesota last night. They didn't come close. The Clippers lost by 21 in Crypto.com. Minnesota shot 54% and had 33 assists. The Lakers are back in action tonight against Detroit. 7.30 tip-off at Crypto. Women's college basketball fans around the country now know that Juju Watkins is a legitimate star. In a nationally televised game on ESPN last night, the Compton freshman dropped 32 points against Arizona. USC wins by 7. Four straight for the Trojans. Watkins has had 30 or more points in nine games. She's one game shy of the single season record set by USC legend Cheryl Miller in 1984-85. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson. More news, opinions, and conversation when we come forward on KBLA Talk 1580. City of Los Angeles landlords that own rent-controlled properties, you are now able to increase rents by 4% for your rent-controlled properties. An extra 1% per utility up to 6% can be added only if you pay the entire gas and electric bill. And don't forget to give your tenant an advanced 30-day written notice for rent increases of less than 10%. It is state law. Learn more about the rent increase at housing.lacity.org. That's housing.lacity.org. We all agree that America has a very serious problem. Okay, KBLA delegation, we need your help as we launch our 2024 climate justice campaign. We would deeply appreciate you going to our KBLA 1580 website and filling out a short climate justice survey, which will help us better serve our beloved community as we build out this campaign. It'll take you just a few short minutes to complete the online survey, and the information you provide us will be invaluable as we do our part to hold folk accountable and amplify the voices of our people in this climate conversation. When you take the survey, you'll be automatically entered to win seats at our annual Black History Month luncheon, Thursday, February 29th. So, hit our website at KBLA 1580. Help us out by taking the short climate justice campaign survey, and you could be our guest at our annual Black History Month luncheon, Thursday, February 29th. Thank you in advance for your consideration and cooperation. At KBLA Talk 1580, we care about the community, we care about the climate. We care about the climate. If you love to travel, Capital One has a rewards credit card that's perfect for you. With Venture X, earn unlimited double miles on everything you buy and turn everyday purchases into extraordinary trips. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges where you just check in and chill out. Open up a world of possibilities with Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Lounge access is subject to change. See CapitalOne.com for details. On your period, sudden gushes happen without warning. But now, you can say goodbye to stand-up gush fears. Thanks to Always Ultra Thins with Rapid Dry technology. It absorbs gushes two times faster than the leading store brand and gives you up to 100% leak-free protection. Hello clean and comfortable with Always Fear No Gush. At KBLA Talk 1580, we do more than just talk. You got a big mouth. Hello, Joe, you're up. Welcome. We're unapologetically progressive, and we don't black down. And we're talking with author, publisher, cultural historian, Dr. Anthony T. Browder. He's been to uh, Egypt 67 times in pursuit of of those studies and he says his three decades or probably four by now of study have led him to the conclusion that ancient africans were the architects of civilization and developed the rudiments of what has become scientific religious and philosophical uh the backbone of of mankind and you know i want to get into that a little more i i was blessed in college uh dr browder to have uh dr richard king 
as one of my <laughs> as one of my instructors at San Francisco State. I remember I took a a class called Black Contribution to Scientific Development, and I was expecting to learn about George Washington Carver and peanut butter, and instead we learned about ancient Egypt and um, <laughs> and Imhotep, and you know, of course, it mm-hmm. changed the entire trajectory of my life, my, my worldview, my philosophy. So rest in peace uh, to Dr. Richard King. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so Richard, yeah, go ahead. Richard, Richard is a brilliant ancestor. Richard is a byproduct of uh, Dr. Alfred Ligon in LA in the Aquarian Spiritual Center. Uh, Richard was one of the organizers of the annual Melanin Conference. Uh, Richard was in um, San Francisco, taught in San Francisco with Asa Hillier, with uh, Wade Nobles, and a host of other scholars. So you were blessed to have sat in his classroom, my sister. That's uh, why you're so bad. I absolutely <laughs> was. I had Angela Davis for an instructor and Dr. Richard King. I mean, I was like, what? Okay, do your homework, kid. Anyway, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> speaking of great scholars with roots in L.A., you are doing a film screening and um, a tribute to... Dr. Renoko Rashidi. One time at Karas, we did a panel with Renoko and a bunch of other folks, and it hit me how many of these great Afrocentric scholars actually hail from South Central Los Angeles. That's just a crazy thing to me. But tell me what we'll expect and why you've chosen to pay tribute to Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Well, um, all of us were, were saddened to learn of the sudden passing of Brother Renoko on August the 2nd, 2021. And uh, he died in Egypt just before he was about to begin a a study tour of Egypt. And we made arrangements to bring his body back to L.A. We helped to organize his funeral. And as we were lamenting the the loss of another incredible soul, uh, we were able to uh, secure the resources to produce a documentary on his life. It took us two years to uh, finish that film, but it's available now, and I'll be coming to uh, California to do several screenings and to discuss the life and works of this powerful giant so that people will never forget him, but also to inspire future generations to to know his work and to continue uh, the effort to raise the consciousness of African people by studying ourselves. Renoko was unique in that um, he traveled to over 130 countries. He did what no other black man, I no other black historian I, I knew had done, and that is he traveled to document the presence of African people in countries around the world, a presence, a physical presence that preceded enslavement. And in many of these instances, show these African descendants to be the original inhabitants of these countries, of these islands all throughout the world. He also visited uh, museums and with his extensive collection of photographs, he has over, uh, probably over uh, three quarters of a million photographs of artifacts of African people in museums all over the world. So this film affords us an opportunity to, to honor this, this ancestor and to help inspire future generations to follow in his footsteps. I mean, I, I talked to Renoko Rashidi many times on my show, um, and it, probably for me the most startling, because it was always something that I hadn't considered, was his work in India. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, his work, Renoko was the first person I knew who had traveled to India and had connected with the Dalit population, the so-called untouchables. And what's interesting now is that uh, a number of people have seen Ava DuVernay's latest uh, film, Origins, and they're just now learning about uh, the untouchables. Uh, they may have read um, the book Cast, which also brought this information to light, uh, the book uh, upon which the film is, uh, is centered. But it's important to note that Dr. Rashidi, back in the 1980s, had traveled to India, had met with Dalai leaders, and it was also responsible for bringing some of those leaders here to the United States, where they toured L.A., they toured Washington, they toured New York City, and talked about their plight. So he was a, a giant on the forefront of many issues that people just now today are beginning to become aware of. So we have to make sure that people know of his great works and that they have options 
to follow in his footsteps whenever possible. So there's a screening on the 16th. Um, the piece is called Global Assignment, The Life and Times of Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Um, that's Friday. Um, that's taking mm-hmm. place here in Los Angeles. And um, you'll be speaking there as well, right? Yes, I will. I'll be talking about uh, about the film and we'll be engaging the audience in questions. That particular engagement on the 16th is going to be held in San Diego at the World Beat uh, Cultural Center. Yeah. And then we'll also, we'll also be in L.A. Uh, on the uh, Monday the 19th. And that event will be at the Center for, for Black Power. Uh, I posted uh, on my Facebook page, um, people can go to Anthony uh, Browder and find listings for these various engagements. And then on the 24th, I'll be in uh, San Francisco at the African American Arts and Culture Center. We'll be doing the screening there, and I also will be doing um, taking questions and then doing a presentation on my upcoming book, Why Kim It Matters. Um, okay, well, you'll have to come back when that comes out, once I get a chance to read it, and hopefully we can we can continue this conversation. I mean, it's really foundational black history in some ways. Um, when I first started interviewing Renoko Rashidi, I'd never been to the motherland, although I felt, feel like being the student of Dr. King, I had, I had mm. studied it and sort of worked on changing my, my mindset to what I would call an African mindset. But um, he, I remember he was always trying to go to more and more countries and find the artifacts, find, talk to the actual people, um, and, and find the, the African, the phenotypically African people in that space, including in India. But, you know, uh, even throughout the continent, just understanding the various folks and histories um, within those African countries, because, you know, as we talked about with Egypt, you've got immigration, colonization, and, um, you know, and, and, and invasion, all sort of confusing us about the origins and histories of, of, uh, people of black African people. Yes. You know, Dominique, what's so, important about this film is that you not only have an opportunity to hear Renoko in his own words, talk about his, his travels, talk about his life, talk about growing up in Compton, but you also have footage of him um, in Mexico, footage of him in, in Egypt, footage of him in other countries and talking about those experiences. And we have a host of, of scholars, uh, other people who worked with Renoko, uh, who are part of his team. We have his family members, talking about his life. So it's a comprehensive overview of an African man viewed by those who knew him and loved him. Put, we put his life into context so that we see him as a human being who possessed a profound love for African people. And uh, we trust that this film will inspire people. Um, there's also uh, a, another special event that's going to be taking place on Wednesday the 21st where there'll be a formal announcement of a local university receiving uh, Renoko's archives. They'll be digitizing his library and making his research available to the world. So I don't want to spill the beans on that just yet, Mm. but um, uh, that event is taking place on the 21st of February. That's great, though, because that's one of the things I worry about is the you know, the work getting lost, even when you try to find Dr. Ben's book, sometimes, you know, you got to mm-hmm. really search. And I just think about this digital age. It's almost like if the stuff isn't digitized and cataloged in that way, it could be lost. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we see right now we're living in an era where books are being taken off shelves. Books are being destroyed right now. And, and so this effort to internalize the collective wisdom of African people is probably more important now than at any point in time in history because people are going out of their way to erase our historical memory. So we have to use all the means at our disposal, all the technology at our disposal in order to make this information accessible to the world. And that's one of the reasons why I've been saying that we're winning this war because they can can ban a book they can burn down a library, but there's so much content out here now hmm. on the internet. 
that is traveling all over the world. So what we have to do now, what we have to remember that the most important trait that one has to cultivate is the judicious sense to know what not to believe. There's a <laughs> lot of misinformation out here, my sister. Yep. There's a lot of misinformation, and it's confusing a lot of people. That is another strategy that is being used by our oppressors in order to minimize the effectiveness of this work. So people have to read. They have to study. They have to raise their consciousness so that they can uh, discern the difference between a truth, a half truth, and a lie. So we have work to do if we're going to save ourselves, save our minds, save our souls, and ultimately save our people. Talking with Dr. Anthony Browder, when we come forward, uh, find out a little bit more about the work you're doing there and those archaeological digs, the work you're doing as what I understand is the only uh, father and daughter team doing that work and what we ought to be looking for and looking at as these conversations unfold. It's KBLA Talk 1580. More of First Things First with Dominique DePrima when we come forward. <coughs> oh, this cold. Honey. <laughs> Honey? Honey. You need DayQuil Severe Honey. DayQuil Severe Honey gives you powerful cold and flu symptom relief with a honey-licious taste. Because life doesn't stop for a cold. Okay, I'm ready to go. (coughs) Now I'm getting a cold. Honey. Try DayQuil Severe Honey for powerful cold and flu relief. DayQuil Severe with honey flavor. The daytime coughing, aching, stuffy head, fever, honey-licious, power through your day, medicine. Use as directed. Keep out of reach of children. Meet Cheryl. Hey. She's on vacation and lost in the moment. Unfortunately, so is her chase debit card. It's got to be somewhere. Maybe she lost it at salsa night. These skirts should have pockets. Or maybe she lost it at Pilates. Three and two and But she's not worried. With the Chase mobile app, she can lock her card till it turns up. Tools that help protect. One bank that puts you in control. Visit chase.com slash checking. Chase, make more of what's yours. Chase mobile app is available for select mobile devices. Message and data reads may apply. J.P. Morgan Chase Bank, N.A. member FDIC. Eggs are a staple in our diets, and there's only one egg with more delicious farm-fresh taste plus superior nutrition. Eggland's best. With more vitamins, including six times more vitamin D and ten times more vitamin E, plus 25% less saturated fat than ordinary eggs. Available in so many delicious varieties. Classic, cage-free, and organic. Eggland's best. Better taste, better nutrition, better eggs. My mom has taken up going to the park to practice yoga. My dad's going to a club, but not a book club, a salsa club. Finding new hobbies comes with age. My mom has started getting lost and not knowing where she's going. Becoming lost or disoriented doesn't. Confusion with time or place may be a sign of Alzheimer's. An early diagnosis can help improve the quality of life for your loved one. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's at 10signs.org. Brought to you by the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. We knew you'd stick around. This is L.A.'s home for progressive talk radio. Welcome back to KBLA Talk 1580. Uh, Welcome back indeed. Dr. Anthony Browder is our guest. We always say um, every month is Black History Month around here, but certainly this is a great conversation uh, for February. Um, You know... This this confusion that you're talking about, I'm hoping that all of this anti-black history uh, will resonate with the young generations and they'll say, you know what, I need to find out what this stuff is they're trying to hide from me. And they'll end up uh, doing even more reading and research. Tell me about how your daughter, um, Atlantis, how she got involved in this work and how you guys work together. Sure. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I was 26 years old uh, when I discovered that the ancient Egyptians were black. I met Dr. Ivan Van Sertema speaking in Washington, D.C., uh, February 21st, 1977. Hearing him say that the ancient Egyptians uh, were black and that they built ships and came to America and established their presence uh, as the Omic people transformed my consciousness. Now, I had attended predominantly black schools all of my life, with the exception of high school. And throughout my former education, I never learned any of this knowledge. As a matter of fact, after meeting Van Sertema, I learned that there existed what I refer to now as forbidden knowledge. So I began the process of um, re-educating myself. And then uh, when I had a child, my daughter Atlantis, 
Uh, I'm a single parent. I've been raising her alone since she was four. I was determined that I wasn't going to send her to school to be mis miseducated. I assumed personal responsibility for teaching her her history. So we've been organizing lectures in Washington, D.C. since um, 1987. So my daughter, we brought in Asa Hillier, Renoka Rashidi, Ivan Van Cernema, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, all the scholars. And my daughter was at every single lecture. Wow. I took her to Egypt <laughs> when she was seven years old. And we wrote her first book when she was eight. At that time, she was the youngest published author in America. So she's been lecturing, traveling around the country and around the world since she was eight years old. So we've written uh, four books now on her travels around the world. And she, is, she now works for me full time. Um, and as I became involved in our excavations in Egypt, and she was with me at the excavation site. She was helping to organize uh, the various missions, working with the people there. And she has the distinction of being the first person of African ancestry to enter the 2,700-year-old burial chamber of the chief priest Karaka Men, 25th Dynasty, son of Shabaka. So we have a legacy that is part of our family. Uh, I am very proud to say, Dominique, that I am now a, a grandfather uh, for the past, uh, it's been 31 days that I've been a grandfather. So my grandson, <laughs> Who's counting? <laughs> my, I'm counting, please. Uh, my grandson will, will continue this tradition because I'm at the point in my life now where I can pour my knowledge into my grandson to ensure that this legacy continues. So I'm putting this out here on the airwaves that we've already started working on my grandson's first book. His first <laughs> book will be published when he's five years old. He will beat his mother's record by three years, and we would establish a broader dynasty that, uh, mm -hmm. fortunately, if all goes as planned, will, will perpetuate itself into the future. So I'm a person who believes wholeheartedly in taking control of your destiny. Uh, and that we have the obligation, uh, the right, the capacity, and the responsibility to tell our own stories and teach our stories to our children first. Parents are the first teachers. Yeah. And so we have to model for them what it means to be African, to be proud and black, not just one day, but every day of our lives. And we've been blessed. My daughter and I have been blessed to work together. We uh, worked in California. I, I would come out to Northern California once a month for eight years, working with groups of African-American students in three different high schools, uh, teaching them their African history and culture. My daughter took that program, the curriculum that I had developed, and developed it into a national curriculum, which we had instituted in 25 countries, 25 cities throughout the United States of America. So she has taken my work to the next level, and the two of us working together will take her son, my grandson, to the next level. We will ensure that we will find our proper place in the sun and that in the future, African people and the world will know who we are and what we've done. Mm. Dr. Anthony T. Browder is our guest. When we come forward, we'll get some final thoughts from him before passing the mic to Tavis Smiley. It's KBLA Talk 1580. A safe place to go loud. 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 A great place for progressive politics. KBLA Talk 1580. 1580. KBLA Talk 1580 is the exclusive media sponsor of This Light of Ours, activist photographers of the civil rights movement. A dynamic new exhibition on view now at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. This Light of Ours showcases more than 150 photos taken by movement insiders from diverse backgrounds that reveal the vital work undertaken by a broad coalition of organizers and everyday people whose collective action changed America. This Light of Ours is one of three temporary exhibitions currently on view at the Skirball, which together explore issues related to civil rights, immigration, and pluralism. Tickets and more information for all three exhibitions are available at skirball.org. That's skirball.org. S-K-I-R-B-A-L-L dot org. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. 
KBLA Talk 1580 reminding you that we keep us safe. Pro Football Hall of Famer and urban peace pioneer Jim Brown believed in just that. So he founded the Amera I Can Foundation for Social Change in 1988, focusing on at-risk and high-risk youth in underserved schools and juvenile detention facilities, as well as adult incarceration and reentry initiatives. The core of the Amera I Can program is its 15-chapter life skills curriculum. Mastery of these skills allows individuals to meet their academic academic potential, conform their behavior to acceptable societal standards, and improve the quality of their lives by equipping them with what they need to confidently and successfully contribute to society. Today, the foundation is led by its president, Monique Brown, who has been actively involved in the organization for more than 25 years. The Amera ICANN Foundation continues its work in memory of its founder, actor, philanthropist, and NFL legend, Jim Brown. To get involved or make a donation, please visit visit AmeriICanCommunity.Partners. That's AmeriICanCommunity.Partners. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. The conversation continues right now, right now, right now with right now. Dominique right now. DePrima on First Things First. First. Things First. And we're talking with Dr. Anthony T. Browder. He's an author. Got a new book coming out when, Dr. Browder? It should be out in late spring. Light spring. We're not talking about your grandchild's book. We're talking about uh, your own <laughs> latest book uh, should yeah. be out in late spring. Uh, right now, he is coming to town to talk about um, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, and you can find those on his Facebook, Anthony Browder on Facebook. Um, I'll have some posted up as well. Um, and we had uh, Ben Frank in the chat asking you how you feel about excavation and the city's turning ancient burial grounds into golf courses. Well, look, there have always been people who have uh, exploited historical events for their own personal gain. Um, it's important to make a distinction about the work that we were doing in Egypt. Uh, we were excavating tombs that had been destroyed by uh, Arabs who lived in that area. They robbed the tombs. They desecrated uh, the, the remains of these ancestors. We came as tomb restorers, and it's important to have a, a, a cultural sensitivity when you're doing this work. But unfortunately, not everyone has, shares those same sentiments, unfortunately. Dr. Brado, what do you want to leave us with this morning in, in our final minute and a half here? Sure. Well, I was listening to a promo uh, during during the break that was talking about a photo exhibition of uh, photographers who were uh, played a pivotal role in the civil rights movement. Yes. And I want to drop this piece of information. Uh, I'm sure many of your listeners don't know this, but one of the photographers featured in the next ex exhibition is a man by the name of Ernest Withers, who lived in Washington, D.C. He followed Dr. King. He photographed all the major moments. What has been released about five or six years ago is that Ernest Withers was an informant for the FBI. And so not only was he following Dr. King and, 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 and other leaders in the movement but photographing them, but he was passing on their information to members of the FBI. So COINTELPRO is real. Mm. There, will be all, there will always be people in our midst who look like us but don't share the same agenda. But we have to be ever vigilant and remember that we have to keep our eyes on the prize, literally and figuratively, and that it is the ancestors who guide us. Ancestral intelligence is the only AI that matters to us. We <laughs> are where we are because of the fact that there are ancestors whose genetic memory we carry in us. I learned that from Richard King. 1989, we sponsored the second Melanin Conference at Howard University. And Richard King said that scientists, that geneticists know that DNA is real and that within the DNA that we carry in our bodies is the memory of all of our ancestors. Accessing those memories is the key. That is ancestral intelligence. When you can tap into those memories that we carry, you can transform the world. That's what Renoko Rashidi did. That's what Richard King did. That's what Asa Hilliard did. That's what John Lee Clark did. That's what Francis Wilson did. And that's what uh, I'm dedicated to devoting the rest of my life to amplifying in my talks, my works, and my writings. So thank you so much, Dominique, for this opportunity. And I look forward to coming back on your show after the book is out. Absolutely look forward to it as well. Um... John Henrik Clark said, powerful people cannot afford to educate the people that they oppress because once you are truly educated, you will not ask for power. You will take it.
Tavis Smiley is up next. Until tomorrow, one love. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. I'm Mike Moore here week. A judge has dismissed the lawsuits against Harvard University over the alleged sale of body parts.